Hey everybody, Adam with Fanic here. Uh, it's been a long time since my last upload. Uh, thank you all so much for your patience and your support of the channel, uh, your comments, your questions. Um, it's really good to be back on the grid here. Uh, I do have a day job and I've been traveling a lot, but uh, I've got a lot of really good videos in the queue for you guys. But I've noticed I've really had a hard time keeping up with all the comments and, and things that are going on. So I decided I'd make a video today and I'm just going to knock out as many answers to your questions that you've posted. I'm going to knock out as many as I can in the next maybe 20 to 30 minutes at most and just um, give, give us some topics, some, some quick, uh, quick fire learning uh, session today. So please keep the, the questions and comments going. I love seeing you guys engage with one another in the comments section, helping one another, you know, starting conversations. Um, this is awesome. We're in the robotics and automation community. We're a, we're, a, we're a small group, but we're a tight group. And I think that's really important. So without any further ado, let's jump into answering some questions. Um, I'm not much on uh, video editing, so I'm gonna use a snipping tool and I'm just gonna drag some questions um, that I've saved up onto the screen and just talk about it. So let's get started. Um, a great question from Joshua um, talking about, I'm going to change my pen here. Um, he's talking about how to uh, restart a cycle after an emergency stop. And Josh has heard that in FANUC you have to kill the current task. No! A resounding no, you do not have to kill. Um, you can stop your robot um, without cycling from the beginning. Do not have to do that. So basically what we're looking at uh, in here um, is we're going to go menu, next, system, config, and um, we're going to look at the C stop for abort. The C stop is the stop signal that the robot is getting from your uh, user inputs, typically a PLC or a signal. Um, keep those as false uh, if you want the robot to not start over. Um, if the robot is receiving a C stop signal and is aborting because of that, so if these are saying true, then yes, every time you get a stop signal, the robot will, it's the same thing as saying function abort all, and it'll take your robot right back to line one of code, right back into the main program. Um, some people need that. Some people it's critical that, hey, if, if we get into this situation, we need to start back at the beginning and check our IOs and check our statuses, and maybe it's for a safety thing. Maybe the first thing you do is go through a homing procedure, um, but you don't have to do that. Um, by nature, um, if you are running the robot and someone issues an e-stop, you will see at the top here, instead of the word abort, it will say your program is paused at line something. So when it's paused, all you have to do is give the robot the start signal again. That can come from the controller or from a PLC or from a push button. But if you tell it to start again, it'll simply take off. From where it left off so uh, it's definitely a strategy thing um, you're more than welcome to start from the beginning if you want but you don't have to and also hey Joshua thanks for the uh, the, the little uh, French tradition joke uh, I appreciate it got a chuckle out of that thank you um, all right I'm going to uh, pick another one here pick and choose a couple good ones let's see all right here's a here's another good one let me snag let me snag Philly's question and bring this onto the screen. All right, Philly. Great video, Adam. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Phil. Thank you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so Philly post here ran into a situation um, using user frames where um, this person taught everything for frame one but then copying it to another program to use frame two, the robot just keeps on doing whatever's in frame one. Well, that sure sounds weird. So 
there's only a few things to look at, in my opinion, um, to make sure that the robot's going to the frame that it should be going to. Um, and please watch my video on user frames because uh, that'll touch on a lot of things. But the first and most important thing is, um, you know, you'll notice that my four favorite lines of code, I always put at the very top of the program. I call my user frame number equals whatever, user tool number equals whatever, set my payload, set my speed. So if that's at a one or that's at a two, uh, everything that follows after that should be referencing user frame whatever. Uh, so double check that, just make sure you have that line of code and also make sure that line of code isn't somewhere else. Some people sprinkle them throughout the code and it's laid down in here somewhere. Um, just, just make sure that that's being used. Um, the other thing you can do to verify it's being used is shift coordinate and you'll see um, which user frame, right now I have user frame zero, which is world, but you'll see which user frame is active. So if you're running your program and you think it should be using user frame two, but the robot's going to user frame one, give yourself a shift coordinate and see, does that say a one or a two, right? Like I can pull that up, there's a two. So um, take a look at that and, and see, make sure that it's actually being called. Um, other things to look at, keep in mind that only your PRs will follow user frames. That's because PRs, when you look at your user frames and user tools, it's all relative to the frame um, that is active. Uh, if you, you see how it says UFF, uh, if I were to just teach a random point in here, that's a P instead of a PR, and I go look at it, you'll see that it has a specific user frame and a specific user tool. That means no matter how many times you change from frame one to frame two, that P position doesn't care. It's just going to keep using whatever it was programmed in. So the only way for your code to be truthfully modular is to be using PRs. The PRs will chase the frame. The Ps will not chase the frame. Um, the other, the last thing that I want you to look at is in your menu, setup frames. And this is my tool frame, so I'll say other and user frame. Go look at your actual frames and just make sure the data is what you think it should be. Make sure that the data between one and two you know, I don't have anything in two, but, but just, you know, make sure that your, your data is actually different. Sometimes people say, hey, I'm, I'm calling user frame one, I call user frame two, it's going to the same spot. Oh, uh, well, maybe the user frames are the same. So take a look at your data in the setup, take a look at, make sure it's being called, give yourself a shift coordinate, just step through everything. Uh, sometimes being a, a robot programmer means being a little bit of a detective. So um, yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, that is that is very good. Next really good question that came rolling in is from Miss Juliana. Thank you so much, Juliana. This is a very good question. Um, also talking about frames. So hopefully Philly uh, has watched this video or is about to watch this video, uh, hopefully so. Um, so Juliana is saying, uh, the Z coordinates, are they really that important for the user frame or just X and Y? Uh, in other words, if the Z position is not the same in the three points, will it cause me any issues? Yup, it will cause you issues. Um, so that's because when you are teaching a frame, Keep in mind that you're teaching a plane. You're going to teach an origin, you're going to teach an X, and you're going to teach a Y. And then the robot is going to take those and it's going to make an imaginary plane out of this that does a lot better than I'm doing on a snippet tool. But if I were to look at this from the side, you teach your origin, you go over here, you teach your X, and then let's say you taught your Y up a little bit, you're going to have a crooked frame. Let me show you a little bit better what that means in, in, uh, in here. So if I were to teach a user frame, 
somewhere out here. Let's uh, let's go ahead and edit uh, a frame. So let's say I wanted to teach the user frame of this table out here. You see how the robot is basically um, going to teach this plane out in space. Okay. Right now, this plane, you know, if I taught my corner and I did my zero, my X, my Y, it says, okay, this is the frame. If my Z value of the X, meaning the value when I go teach the X, if that's up here, well, the only way for the plane to touch something up there is if the plane looks like that, All right? So I teach my zero, I teach my Y, and then when I go to teach my X, if I give it a plus Z, the whole plane, the whole user frame gets wonky. Um, and so let's say I do that, if I apply that. What you'll see in here, you'll start seeing values in the yaw and pitch. If you have values in your yaw and pitch, which are the tilt of your plane, uh, then yeah, that means you had some Z height in there. Uh, you can also, of course, find that in here, menu, setup, frames, detail. So I can look at my X, Y, Z, yaw, pitch, and roll. Uh, if you have pitch in there, you taught something at a Z value. Um, so uh, that's designed to help you, not hurt you, by the way, um, because if this table actually was wonky, you'd want to be able to teach the robot that it's like that. And the only way to do that is to go up in Z over in X and teach that. And then when you come back, you'd have to go down in Z over in Y to teach that. So yes, the Z value is very, very important um, when when teaching your frames because it will uh, it'll set you up for success or failure. It's a tool, not a curse. Um, so thank you very much, Juliana, for that. Um, let's see. Uh, got one here. This is not a question. It's a comment, but I'm going to tell you guys anyway. I love when people give me recommendations. Um, is it possible to talk about I.O. signals? Yup, I surely can talk about uh, safe I.O. signals, and I will do so. Um, I've got a running queue of videos that I'm going to start releasing very soon. I'm gonna, really going to try and do these weekly or every other week. So do the subscribe and bell and all those great things that, that help you and help me. But yes, um, going to be going to be doing that. Um, you know, I, I've see, and then I've, next question, I see a lot of these, the eye pendant controls. Man, guys, I wish I could like publicly post that or, or put some site up or something like that. But I am, you know, legally at liberty not to do so being a FANUC employee. Uh, you got to call your local FANUC office. Um, FANUC is in every country just about. We're worldwide. Just reach out. Just, just Google us. Figure out who's the closest to you. Send them an email. Send them a phone call. Um, they will help you. It's their job to, to give you these things. Um, so, yeah, definitely, definitely reach out. Um, your local FANUC guy can help. Uh, another one that's coming up soon is uh, complementary IOs and IO interconnect. It's a very powerful tool to have IOs constantly being monitored um, and turning themselves uh, on and off. Um, so I will, um, I will do that. A quick shout out um, to uh, one of my subscribers, uh, one of my followers here. Uh, focused. Uh, I'm seeing this account on a lot of different uh, uh, videos. Thank you. Uh, this is a special shout out for you. Uh, I see them helping other users and giving good answers um, to good questions, um, staying engaged. I love when you guys do this. It just warms my heart that we're all learning together. Um, let's see. Some more questions. Here's another question that came off of one of my came off of my user frame setup one. If I have a program made on a table already, 
and I change my user frame to the corner of the table, it will change my points, right? Yup. Uh, if so, is there uh, an easy way to do this without messing up pre-existing programs? Okay, so this is, this is a tale as old as time, guys. One of the first things you should be doing with your robots, the first thing you do is you set your payload. The second thing you do is set your tool frame. And the third thing you do is set your user frame. Payload, tool, user. Um, but guess what? Not everyone does that. They start working. They start making paths. They make programs. And then later down the road, they decide, hey, you know what? Uh, I should really have a user frame, shouldn't I? Yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. But when you do that, it's going to move all the positions that you taught because everything you taught probably would have been in world frame, which is the default user frame zero. So everything was taught from the belly button of the robot. So you're teaching positions out here. It's all relative to the belly button. Well, then all of a sudden you put a frame out here in the corner and all your points end up way out in space, probably unreachable. So there's, you know, there's a few things you can do there. Um, probably one of the things you can try and do is use our program shift function. And maybe that's another video that, um, uh, that I should make uh, program shift where you can take an entire program and, uh, uh, and move points around and, and uh, adjust your program based on that. So if you wanted, you could figure out exactly X, Y, Z, how much you are moving from world to the frame, which is just this data. Say, all right, you know, I went from being zeros to 1000 and X and negative 1200 and Y and positive 130 and Z. And you could shift every single one of your points um, backwards, do the opposite, shift your X's negative and your Y's positive and your Z's negative, and it would bring all your points back. Um, the other thing, uh, RoboGuide is a really good help. Uh, it'd be a lot quicker to modify your programs in here than it would be on your real robot. Otherwise, man, if, if you've got a program out there that's running and humming along, um, I would just say let, let it hum. Don't, don't make any more work for yourself. Don't make a user frame after the fact that you should have made a user frame. You kind of paint yourself in a corner. And there's not really an easy way out of that corner uh, without getting your feet wet right um so let's see here uh oh another good question this question is really really popular um let me pull it up on the screen here how to get robo guide talking to a physical plc um i think this and the answer ended up in the comments section of this video but maybe not um the biggest trick you need to do is menu, next, system, variables. And once in your system variables, get down, down, down to the EIP enable IO. By default, that's a zero. You need to change that to a one and then cycle power, do a cold start right up here, do a cold start on your robot. That will allow the um, your, your host com, your 127.0.0.1, it'll allow RoboGuide to take control of your Ethernet port, the physical port on your laptop, and talk to something that's plugged into it. So turn that to a one, uh, cycle power, and then, um, you know, also your robot does have to have the options on it, right? So, like, if I look at this robot version ID and look at my um, options, uh, this robot has the Ethernet adapter on it. You have to have Ethernet adapter or Ethernet scanner. You have to have some option on your robot in here. Then you have to set that system variable, cycle power, 
and then you have to go into your IOs, your Ethernet, and set up your connection like you normally would, um, uh, setting everything up. Uh, you should also be able to um, look at uh, all your host com settings. Um, again, it's just going to go right through the, the main port of the, of the laptop. Um, actually, where is that? Uh, now i got to try to remember where our host com is. I believe it's set up. There it is, host com. Uh, host com TCP IP is your first one. So if I open that up. Uh, you can you got to configure the address of your robot and put that in. So um, you can definitely give that a whirl. And you again, you can always call FANUC uh, hotline support um, with questions on that. Um, all right, let me scroll through, find some more really good questions. Uh, these are these are really fun. Um, ooh, this one's interesting. Let me pull this up. Um, this is interesting. This is a good conversation starter. Uh, Marcello, I'm hoping I say that right. M Marcello, Marcello. Um, depends what country you're in. Um, question, can I disable a DCS zone and enable the other in case I have specific conditions? In oh, you know what? I, I thought when... When I first read it, I thought he wanted one zone to enable another, uh, and that was going to be a tough question. But actually, your question is very straightforward. What am I going to write, guys? What am I going to write? Yup. That is a super American way of saying yes, but uh, bear with me. All right, so yup. You can disable DCS zones and enable in others. That's, that's one of the best features of DCS is the ability to dynamically change uh, goes, your, your, your go zones and no-go zones. So if we look at DCS, let's say I had a Cartesian position check set up, which I currently do not. But if this was built, the boxes were made, life is good. Um, do, 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 bam disabling input so this is the line you want to look at so when you build a zone like a CPC uh, it's it, it defaults to being on that that zone is gonna be on whether it's a go zone or a no-go zone it's either gonna keep the robot in there or keep the robot out there you can make that zone not work by disabling it with a safety signal um, the best way to do that is either a SPI, which is a safety peripheral input, or a SIR, a safety input relay. Um, we should probably have a video that talks about safe I.O. signals, uh, like that recommendation I, I heard earlier. What normally happens, the normal thing you see, is that people will have a robot like this, and they'll have, uh, maybe they'll have a pallet on one side of the robot and a pallet on the other. And as I'm loading the pallet on the left, let me make it left and right. While I'm loading a pallet on the left, um, we want to keep people away from the right. So this DCS zone would be active saying, do not go to the right. Well, then someone has to come get this pallet. So the robot has to go over here and work on this pallet while someone gets in and out of the zone here with a, a fork truck. The way we do that is we set up a light curtain on the left and a light curtain on the right. When the left light curtain gets broken, it tells the robot, uh, disable your CPC, go over here and only work here and ignore anything going on there. And then when I'm over here working, I can use that same safety signal uh, to disable this zone, let someone come in and out. So basically, you're giving the robot the ability to not stop when a light curtain is broken because DCS is going to confine it to working on the side where the human is not there. Um, as you can imagine, there are associated risks with that because, hey, if a human decides to go in there and then lay down on a conveyor, uh, they could still get 
terribly hurt, right? So there always has to be, you know, some additional safety questions and discussions and planning and ways to keep people from killing themselves. Uh, but the, the short answer is yes, you can turn them on and off using the disabling inputs and dynamically run your safety zones. So very good question. Um, let me know in the comments if we need to go deeper on that. Um, let's see here. Bum, 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 bum. Some good questions, good questions. Um, ooh, from my friend at Focused. From my friend at Focus. Let's throw this guy on the screen. How'd you get the triads to have rotational blocks at the end of it? Mine will not rotate and does not have the blocks. Uh, that sounds like a robo guide thing. Uh, let me let me see if I see what, what you're talking about. Robot is down here and I want to twist the robot. I like to zoom out and click on that green orb. As you zoom in, the green orb gets tinier and tinier and gets hard to click on. So I like to zoom out so the orb gets big enough that I can click on it. And once I have that orb highlighted, now I have these balls at the end, these handles. So if I grab the middle of the handle, I can move in X. But if I mouse to the end of the handle, it'll rotate and I can rotate around X rotate my yaw. So hopefully you just need to click on the orb and get your mouse in the right handle position. Uh, it works for these tables too. Um, I can move this table in X or if I put my mouse over the end where it rotates, I can rotate in X. Um, so hopefully it's an easy fix for you, bud. Um, let me know in the comments if uh, you're not able to rotate things. That's a pretty important function. Um, let's see. We've got more DCS questions. One from Karen Patel. All right. What's a oh, Karan? Sorry, not Karen. Ha! Shows, how, shows where I'm from. All right. Karan Patel. Um, he has a wall mount FANUC robot. When he sets his no-go zones in DCS, uh, he sees the 4D DCS display envelope is somewhere in the air because mounting on the wall changed the world frame. Any suggestions for a wall mount robot? So the important thing to remember it with robots is everything is relative. So if you take this guy and you bolt him to a wall, right? Now he's up on a wall, which is common. This is, this is a normal thing that people do. And now you have a robot working like that. Very normal. But when you do that, just keep in mind that DCS still thinks um, the robot is, and I can't even rotate it that way, but it, it still is doing everything from world. Um, also make sure when you're setting up your robot on a wall, you should be going into a controlled start. Function, cycle power. Do you want to cycle power? I want to do options. Hold on, auto saving. Options and go into a controlled start because in your controlled start, you can define that that robot is mounted at 0, 90, 180 if it's upside down. Uh, or, or any number in between. And it's important for that robot to know where it's mounted because otherwise, you know, it doesn't know any better. You have to tell it. Um, but DCS is still going to base everything from the belly button of the robot. So when you start building your zones, just use that 4D graphics display. Use the viewport on your uh, Teach Pendant. Uh, if you have RoboGuide, use RoboGuide. But build those zones rotated and relative to that robot's belly button. Everything should be measured from there. Whether it's out this way or out this way, it doesn't matter, it should be all there. So make sure you're um, telling the robot that it's mounted on a wall and then uh, just try and, uh, try and do some spatial geometry, my friend. Can be tough, can definitely be tough. Let's see here. Ah, okay, here's a good one. 
Uh, oh, I love this. This is a good question and a good answer. I love when you guys help help each other. It's a great community. Um, we got a student uh, working in RoboGuide looking for uh, the 2D package. They're like, hey, it's not there. What do I do? Uh, this person is exactly right. Select the robot, then properties. Um, let's see here. Serialize. That's the winning combo. You have to serialize. So let me show you guys what that means. If I wanted this robot to have an option on it that I previously um, had not put on there. Robot properties. Click on my robot. So I've got my robot properties dialog box open. Up here is the serialized robot. You see I get a pop-up. Change robot model. Change software. Hey, come back. I wasn't done with you. Uh, robot software options and so on. Um, so yes, if I click that, it'll open up my wizard. My wizard, I say. There you are. And I can create a modification. And I can click through this thing. Um, I can actually change what robot model it is and actually swap out and try a different model. So that's fun. Um, or I can come into here and I can just start adding options. Any option that Fanuc makes, um, you can put it in, test it, load it on the robot. And then when you're done, you just click finish and uh, then it'll cycle power and your robot will have whatever option you need it to have. So thank you guys for that. Um, let's see here. Boom, 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 boom. Got a couple questions. Sometimes people ask um, questions that uh, maybe I've answered in other videos. Um, thank you so much, Joseph. I love the support. Um, wants to talk about string registers? I have a video on string registers. Go check it out. It's it's reasonably good stuff. I think it's good. Um, let's see. Um, here's a question that I'm not quite sure about, but let's talk. Alan, is there a way to allow the robot to know if the operators actually change the electrodes or am I missing something in the program? I'm not sure what you mean by electrodes, brother. Um, if you're talking about physical IO wiring or safety wiring, there's no way for a robot to know that someone moved a wire, unwired something, or rewired something. Um, we, we, we can't uh, trace that. Um, but what we can trace is if you use the password protection option, it's a software option you can put on any FANUC robot. With password protection, uh, you have the ability to uh, track keystrokes, program changes, setting changes, variable changes. It'll, it's a total black box data logger. Um, it'll let you know who changed it, what they changed, and what time they changed it. So if you've got somebody sabotaging your business, um, use password protect for sure. Um, let's see. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, here's one. Breaks my heart when I see these. Here we go. Bob, old Bobby, Bob H. Adam, I have an older uh, R2000 on an R30 controller. I don't see if then. Some of you guys might not believe it, but if then didn't used to exist. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Bob, you can, as long as you're on an R30IA, which you say you are, uh, you should be able to get the latest and greatest software update for that. Um, I think it'll push you all the way up to like, I can't remember if it's version 8 or maybe version 7 point something. But ask your local FANUC rep for an update and say, I need the latest update. And I, it, it should be released then. Um, anyone who has the R30IB or the IB plus, it's already there, it's already built in, it's standard. 
But when you start getting into robots that are, you know, 15, 20 years old, <laughs> if then didn't even exist. So you have to get a software update on that, my friend. And um, uh, hopefully that gets you, gets you off to the races. Um, here's another good one. Hey, and a repeat user. I just saw SOE men just a minute ago. So we men. Uh, can you show how to do the CPU battery replacement? So all of our robots, like you see uh, this handsome hunk changing the Scara robots, all of our robots have um, the batteries in the robot that keep the encoders alive and keep the mastering alive. But we also have lithium ion batteries on the main board as well um, that need far less replacement um you know instead of doing it every six to 12 months you, you go years and years without doing it um on robots that have um the larger controllers you just open the door and unplug it and plug it in on a scara because the controller is so small and compact there's not an easy access door you have to physically pull the screws um i think there's eight screws, eight or 10 screws all around the outside of that cabinet. Uh, you pop the screws and just lift the top. Maybe it's not even that many. Maybe it's only four screws for the top. I don't have the scare in front of me anymore. My wife made me get it out of the kitchen. Um, but there are four screws or a series of screws. You pop the lid right off that bad boy and you'll see the, the battery in there. Um, of course, feel free to call your uh, local FANUC contact uh, and you can look at the maintenance manual and, uh, get details from that um oh man this is a philosophical question and i am really loving mr stephen pierce dude that is the million dollar question my friend um so when i'm looking at how do i choose a robot for an application um i try and look at a few important things I look at reach, I look at rate, and I look at payload. So how far do I have to reach out on this bad boy? I hope you guys love that I'm using a mouse to write on the screen. You know, this is just so high tech, top of the line editing. Um, but basically what we want to do is we want to see, yeah, do I need to reach a, a a pallet, a conveyor, do I need to reach into a machine? Do I need to reach up or down? How long does it have to be? How fast does it have to be? And how heavy is the stuff we're lifting? Always keep in mind that's not just the box or the part we're lifting, but uh, the tooling that's going to do the lifting as well. That counts against your payload. And uh, if you're in Fanic America, like if you're in America like I am, you can go to the Fanic America website and um, there's actually a robot finder tool and it basically asks these questions. And as you click, it'll narrow it down and uh, get you down to just a, a few um, quick uh, possibilities. Um, in fact, you know what? Um, let me see if I can. Let's see here. Well, I'm going to pull up something for you guys to see. Here we go. I want you guys to be able to take a screenshot of this um, right here. This is available on our website as well. Uh, keep in mind, this is for the Americas. So for my overseas viewers, um, yours might be slightly different, but um, this is what I'm talking about. You know, someone says, hey, Adam, I have an application. Well, we have 220, actually more. We have more than 220 robot models. So how do I pick it? Well, I start looking at how far do I have to reach? What can the robot carry, right? And then, you know, in my mind too, I start thinking about, you know, how fast these things have to be. Um, but this, this chart is really helpful for, you know, how many axes does the robot have? What can it lift? What does it reach? How much? Um, this is a great tool. Um, screenshot it guys Here, here's this one snap it here's this one snap it um, really really good stuff so here's that and that was a very good question um, we deal with this every single day
Um, some more questions. Um, by the way, I get this question a lot, and I'm sorry I don't answer you guys more. Videos about line tracking. Line track. Line tracking is a really advanced topic that would probably, I would have to make three, four, five videos to step you guys through all the little nuances on it. Um, the best thing to do with this one is take the FANUC class. Um, you know, there's, there's just so much that goes on with encoders and tracking frames and in, inbound and outbound and discard lines and buffering and load balancing and calib and just calibrating everything and who mama and, and when to be line tracking to chase a moving target and when to go to a fixed non-moving target um and then you know lord help you now then what if you've got vision you know right what if you have to find the part while you're tracking it you gotta you gotta be a top of the line player uh to get into this and i just I almost I feel like it'd be doing a disservice to to IR pick tool and disservice to line tracking if I tried to knock it out in a half hour or even an hour video. Um, you know, Fanuc has a four day or a five day course, five eight hour days trying to teach it to people. I'm not going to knock this out on YouTube, guys. Um, maybe I'll do a video that has some tips and tricks, but it's it's unfortunately I can't condense a week's worth of knowledge into a, a YouTube video. Um, so let's see here. Um, got a few more questions, guys, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today, but I'm going to knock out as many as I can. So Ezra, Ezra has a question, says, uh, struggling to have a tool head change. Now, Ezra, in RoboGuide, there's two ways to do a tool head change. One of them is uh, super easy, and one of them's a little bit of sleight of hand. Okay, um, and I, I almost, you know what, I almost could do a whole video on this. Um, but let's say I have two different tools. Uh, let's see here. Oh, which I do. Look at me. All right, so I have a tool that's a pointer and a tool that's a vacuum. So in my code, as I'm writing my code, If I call UTool4, RoboGuide will intelligently pull up UTool4 and pull up the CAD for that part. If I call up UTool2 and run that, it will intelligently pull up UTool2 and run that. So this is the less sexy but easier way is while you're running, just pause the robot somewhere and call a different UTool. If you want it to look more realistic, if you want it to look like a shunk tool changer or an ATI tool changer where the robot picks up and sets down a tool, you cannot use these. Um, you'll have to leave it blank, leave it totally naked like this, and then you make your tool be a part, and then you pick up your part, you would pick up your tool as if it's a part. Okay, so just like the same way as I go and pick up a, a box, I would go and pick up a gripper, wave around my gripper in space, and then move down and set down the gripper like a part. So basically, you would just add your vacuum as a part, and then pick and place your part with a, uh, a, you know, a naked robot, and it'll look realistic. It'll look like your robot is picking up a tool and then doing stuff with the tool, but what people don't know is you're actually just picking and placing a part. Um, so it's a little bit of a strategic thing and I hope I didn't lose you in the weeds there. I would recommend just use your tools, just toggle them, use your U-Tool number, they'll change. It'll just blink on the screen and go, boop, hey, I have a vacuum now. Um, but if you did want to show somebody the sexy nature and the realistic nature of an actual tool changer where you have a bunch of tools on a table and you go get them, you have to import them into RoboGuide, not as a tool. Import them as a part and pick them up like you're carrying a part, and that will work. Um, let's see. We've got a few more good questions before we wrap up today. Um, 
Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Here's a good one that people talk about. Let's bring that onto the screen. Mr. Paul Smith, uh, new to the channel. Thanks, Paul. Love you, man. Hope you're liked and subscribed and all the good things. Um, Paul is looking at the user tool setup, and he's seeing that um, he's been told that the approaches should be 90 degrees apart and that 180 would be less accurate. Is the 180 degree second approach only for three point? Can it be applied to six point? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Whoever told you that um, is wrong. Sorry. I'll argue with them too, especially because inside the FANUC programming manual written by the kings over in Japan, uh, they recommend the 180. And that's because, and, and you can think about this too. If I have a tool, like, like let's say here's my, my robot, and I have a tool that should be perfectly straight, right? I have a pointer, and, and there's my robot, okay? If that tool's perfectly straight, then when the robot rotates 90 or 180, it doesn't matter because the, the, the target that I'm aligning it with It'll, it'll stay in the same spot. But what happens if you have a tool that was machined and it's got a little bit of a bend? Okay. Well, now when I go and touch off here at zero degrees on J6, that's great. And when I rotate this bad boy, I'm going to change my pen. When I rotate this bad boy, if I rotate it 90 degrees, it'll take that bend and it'll put it right here. But if I rotate it 180 degrees, it'll take that bend and put it here. So the largest source of error margin is actually turning it 180 degrees. So what you wanna do is, especially if you have a crooked tool, let's do this again with a sketch. If I have a crooked tool, I teach my first point like this, and then I rotate that tip 180 degrees and teach my second point like this. So you'll actually have to move your robot. The robot will have to move in the X direction or the Y direction uh, to get your tool tip lined back up with, the, with whatever your marker is. And so what's going to happen now is your robot will learn that curve the best when you give it the largest delta, the largest, largest variance, um, it's just easier to interpolate where that tool is when you give it more room. People ask me that question too about user frames. They're like, hey, could I teach a zero, a X, and a Y? Or do I need a zero, a X, and a Y? Well, the farther out you get, the more accurate you're going to be in between. Yeah, you could have taught it there and there and called it a day, but then you're going to be mostly accurate in here. Whereas if the farther out you can go, the more accurate we're going to be able to interpolate that data. So um, now that I've gone full John Madden on this, uh, rest in peace. He was a hero. Way to go, John Madden. But now that I've gone full John Madden, Madden you know, boom. Um, now that we've done that, uh, let me, uh, <laughs> me re-grab your question here. All right, so John Madden says you need to go 180. Um, can it be applied to the six-point method um, uh, for your uh, tool frame? Can it be applied to the six-point method? Yeah, um, we, we recommend it. The six-point method just also brings in if your tool is on an angle and you want your, um, you know, if your tool has uh, an angle like this, and you don't just care about the tip, you actually care about what that angle is in space, um, what, what that theta is, you'll need the six point method to, to teach the robot the angle. Um, yep, so that was very good, Paul. Very, very good, welcome to the channel. You only had to wait three days for your answer. Um, and I'm gonna answer one more question. What's the time on the clock here? Oh man. I thought I was going 20 or 30 minutes. It's been almost an hour. All right, last question, guys. Last question. Hopefully this is helping everybody. Last question. 
if I wanted to add a couple layers, would I have to create a PR for the tray offset, then write another for loop? Um, to get you guys up to speed, he's looking at the FANUC palette array programming uh, pattern. Um, you so in this in this video, um, I have an array of parts, something like this, all right, that are nice and neat. And I show how to do uh, palette arrays with for loops, where you in use PRs to increment the X and increment the Y. And JA, you're exactly right. If you want to add layers, you would also add a Z element. And so, you know, you'd end up with three for loops. You'd end up, uh, I can actually kind of, but let me go down here, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, it, you, you, let me just insert a bunch of lines. So you would end up with, a for loop nested inside of a for loop nested inside of a for loop. So you'd have this loop doing your X. Uh, let me think about this. The inner loop goes first. So you'd have your X's, your Y's, and your Z's. So you would do rows, columns, layers. So it would index every single time. Um, and if my answer is tripping people up who are like, what are you talking about, dude? Uh, go watch that video. This is one of the first videos I ever put on. Um, really helpful. J.A., I would also recommend I have two other videos that show different methods for um, programming arrays. This one shows using for loops. I've got another one that uses uh, registers and just counters. And then I got another one that uses the FANUC built-in uh, palette uh, handler. So um, there's a lot of different ways to get this job done. But if you're, if you're working on it, uh, yes, nest yourself one more for loop. Do your X's, then your Y's, then your Z's. Or your Y's, then X's, then Z's. Those are interchangeable. Or, well, heck, so are your layers, man. If you wanted to, uh, you could you could do, you know, your entire column before you move over and then do a whole column and then move around a whole column. So you have full flexibility. It's, it's totally up to you, J.A., um, and I hope that works out well for you. So, you guys, it's been great. Uh, I just I feel like I'm finally reconnecting with everyone again. More and more videos coming up very soon. Keep the great recommendations, questions, and comments coming. And boy, as always, have fun coding.